So just a reminder to everyone that this uh, will be recorded and we'll be sending a link, a link out in about a week for anyone that would like to either rewatch or for anyone that you know of who signed up for this and um, can't be here today. I'd like to also remind anyone who uh, comes in and is unmuted um, just to mute yourself. Uh, that's just less of a distraction for the speaker. Okay, so, so I push that and if there's a line across, I'm muted? Correct. Okay, so I should unmute myself now. Okay. You, should, you should mute yourself, yes. I think we should, we should get started as people had long enough to get, get in here. Okay, all right, I'll begin. Well, welcome everyone to the second in our 2022 series of educational events. My name is Peg Solon, and I'm on the leadership team of the Southeast chapter of UVM Extension Master Gardeners. Our mission is to use research-based gardening information to help all Vermonters improve their gardening and environmental stewardship skills. This is our second year of collaboration with the Rockingham Free Public Library in Bellows Falls. Extension Master Gardeners select and provide the speakers and the library hosts us on Zoom. My library co-host today is programming librarian Ann Dempsey. We provide these webinars for free to make gardening education easily available. If you'd like to help support our programs, you can make a donation through Eventbrite. Today's event has captioning to make it accessible to hard of hearing and deaf participants. We will be recording the event and registrants will link, uh, will receive a link to the recording in about a week's time. In a moment, we will begin learning all about that worrisome creature, the Asian jumping worm. But first I'd like to mention that if you are not a master gardener and would like to become one, go to the University of Vermont Extension Community Horticulture website at uvm.edu. All the information you need to apply is on the website. And if you don't live in Vermont, don't worry. Most of the states in the US have master gardener programs. Just go to your state university's extension website and you'll find the information there. No matter where you live though, check out the EMG website at uvm.edu for lots of science-based information and advice on gardening. And now on to our talk, jumping worms. Why worry? What can you do? Jumping worms are invasive earthworms hailing from far Eastern Asia. Their major mode of spread is with horticultural goods, but other mechanisms are also suspected vectors. These earthworms can damage deciduous forest ecosystems in the northern part of the USA and in Canada. However, recently they have also been linked to plant damage in gardens and horticulture. This talk by Dr. Joseph Gores will introduce the biology of these earthworms, the history of the invasion, and suggest ways to manage. Dr. Gores is an associate professor at the University of Vermont. He teaches soil science and his research includes the study of jumping worms. His areas of interest include soil physical properties, soil fauna, and ecological management for soil quality. His teaching and research connect ecosystem services with agricultural economics for the sustainability and prosperity of farms in Vermont. Welcome, Dr. Gores. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Margaret. Um, well, welcome. I, I, I'm really happy to see so many of you. Um, and I know that that behind those large numbers coming to <laughs> coming to these meetings is the fear and the anxiety and the anger that goes with jumping worms. <laughs> so there's actually been a study on the emotional impact on jump on jumping worms uh, of jumping worms on, you know, on, on your mood even. Um, and uh, it's amazing how many people are uh, emotionally affected by them. Uh, having said that, I, I would encourage you to take it easy and uh, relax, even though you might worry about the jumping worms. We'll get to, we'll get to some, some things you can do later on so that that would probably help you um, lower your anxiety level. So. Uh, I'm giving this talk, but I should say that uh, I should say that uh, I'm not necessarily the only one that's working on jumping worms around the Northeast. 
Uh, so there's groups in at Colgate University, there's groups at uh, SUNY uh, State University of New York, um, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota are very strong uh, collaborators in, in some of the programs that uh, that are out there that deal with jumping worms. Cornell University, I, I should mention them as well. Um, but anyway, so here in, in Vermont, uh, my collaborator, Mariam Nuriain, she's, she's my, my graduate student currently, and she'll be graduating or she'll be defending her, her PhD thesis next Thursday. And um, she has a lot of, um, she has contributed a lot of information to these talks. So I, I'd like to acknowledge her right at the beginning. <clears throat> anyway, uh, let's move on. A history of the earthworms, you probably already know this, but I guess mention it just in case. Uh, so uh, the last ice age that lasted for a long period of time until about 10,000 years ago, uh, basically extirpated earthworms in the region here on the screen on this map that is north of this, that's north of this uh, black line. So this, this light blue color over here is where you don't expect to find uh, native earthworms. There are there are a few that made it made it into that region, uh, but it'd be less than one percent uh, of the worms that that are in in Canada and northern part of the U.S. that are native to North America. And then south of that line, you do actually have native earthworms, uh, and we we'll get I might say something about that later. But we have really two invasions, invasion waves that have covered. Uh, the North American continent. And so the first one were European earthworms that came with ship ballast. Um, so the, the ships came, the ships were weighed down in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they came over, they then unloaded the ship ballast, which is, used to be uh, mainly soil. Uh, and then all the goods that were uh, exported from North America and imported into Europe were added. And so with that, with that ballast, uh, you got a lot of things like night crawlers, red worm, red worm, red uh, wigglers, uh, and and several other species. And now they're moving around with uh, vermicompost, with horticulture, but also with um, with activities such as fishing. So recreation is also one of the the ways these worms move around. And then we have the second wave, and those are the jumping worms. And uh, there's a bunch of common common names: so snake worms, crazy worms, crazy snake worms, jumper worms, Jersey wrigglers, wood elves, and Alabama jumpers. There's a whole list of them, and we are encouraged to use the, we to, we are encouraged to use the word jump jumper worms now or jumping worms now, because uh, you know of we might give snakes a bad name, you know so. Uh, so in the north, north, northeastern states and all the way over to Minnesota, we've agreed on using jumping worms as as the common name for uh, all the all the jumping worm species that are out there. Uh, and so they they arrived basically. This is the theory. Uh, there, there were two points of introduction. The first one was in California shortly after uh, trade with Japan was opened again. So that was, you know, 19, so 1852, there was a gunboat that went to Japan and said, open, open your borders, uh, start trading with us again. Um, and shortly after that, in, in, the, nine, in, the, in the 1860s, uh, jumping worms were discovered in, in California. And then on the East Coast, the, the thought is that they might have come here with, um, with the cherry blossoms uh, that were delivered to um, to D the DC, DC area, and uh, so there, there was one there was one shipment in 1908 uh, where the shipment wasn't fumigated, uh, but that wasn't known until until the the cherry blossom trees the cherry trees were were put put out and planted, and so a couple of years later they all ripped out again, and a new but batch of cherry blossoms arrived that was fumigated. So people think that. A lot of the jumping worms that have arrived in in um, on the east coast were part of this first shipment of cherry blossoms, uh, and you know right here in in 
the Northeast, we're worried, uh, we're worried about three species in particular, Amenthus agrestis, Amenthus torquiensis, and Metaphyre hilgendorfi. And they're all part of this, this uh, jumping worm group. Um, there's a scientific name that, that is used for, these, for this group of um, species, and that's ferritamoids. And you can see that name written down here. And uh, it refers to an old uh, genus. This genus still exists, but it's, it's much smaller than it used to be. It used to be a catch-all for all these jumping worms. And now you notice there's, uh, you know, at, there's two genera that are listed here, Minthus and Metaphyre. Um, but anyway, what's important is that, you know, we can call these worms jumping worms. There's three species that, that are of concern right now. There's two more in, in, uh, in New York um, and South that, that seem to be relatively common, but not as common as these three species. Where are they? So here's, here's a, a view of, of the eastern part of North America. Um, and all these dots basically are reported places. And, and this has filled in a lot more because uh, people have been putting, um, putting points on, um, on apps like uh, geographic information apps like iNaturalist or iMap Invasives, which you can download, by the way, and, and, and enter any sightings into, um, into those, those databases. Uh, until recently, the Canadians were very proud to say, we don't have those jumping worms. And uh, you notice there's these blue areas. These are the latest sightings in, in uh, well, the late, latest reports from, uh, from Canada. So Toronto area and Niagara Falls, as well as New Brunswick and Nova Scotia have reported these worms now. I should mention also here on this map, you see two shadings of gray. The dark shading is basically where these worms might be able to survive based on the climate that is there. And then the, if you go further north and the slighter shade, shade of gray, those are areas where, they, uh, where the, the length of the growing season is too short for them to become mature. And therefore, they're unlikely to uh, survive there. They might survive in gardens closer to houses where you have uh, where you have like a slight, slightly warmer microclimate, uh, but in general, those areas, those, those light, light gray areas are um, are probably not not good for them, and they will not survive there. Uh, here's one of the culprits, uh, Amenthus agrestis, and so I show this for two reasons. One reason is to point out that you don't have jumping worms if in the summer you don't see worms like that that have a clitellum, which is this light band area here that goes all the way around that, that body of that worm. Um, and I also show it because this shows really well uh, the, what the castings look like. So people say, well, they look a bit like coffee grounds. Uh, they're very loose. Uh, they would have to be very coarsely ground coffee grounds. Uh, but this is what they look like. You can move them around. They, uh, those 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 coffee those, those coffee grounds are basically um, they're not coffee grounds they're castings right so these castings are very very super loose likely um, very susceptible to uh, erosion. Here's the three species of concern. Um, they have slightly different sizes, but you notice there's there's a, there's an overlap in size. So sometimes I say, well, I can tell by the size of these worms, right? So if they're really really big like greater than seven inches. I know it's, it's this metaphy, metaphy Hilgendorfi. If they're really small, like uh, 30, so one, one inch of size in the summer, then I know it's Amenthus tokiensis, but there's overlap in the sizes. So it's not easy to tell them apart by size. Uh, one of the big questions we, we want to answer in, in uh, research that's coming up is, what is the phenology of these worms? So phenology refers to the phenomena that goes with, with the species. So when do they become adults? Uh, when is there a peak in the abundance? When do they first hatch? So basically life, life history events uh, are, are related to phenology. When does, when does this happen during the year? And is it related to, to some kind of climatic factors is it related to maybe some the phenology of other things like you know the the blooming of uh, or the leaf out of uh, trees 
uh, what are the relationships between uh, what the snake worms are doing and and climate, weather, and of course other things that that might be occurring with other species. Um, so we've been monitoring one site over the years. Um, it's a it's a sugar bush in South Burlington, and uh, we've been counting basically counting individuals uh, throughout the year. So here, here's here's four years worth of data. Each line here is is uh, is the abundance, the number of individuals per unit area. I'm using square meters here. So divide this by ten, you get get this by uh, square foot. Um, and you see four lines here, one one each for for the uh, for each year. And you notice these lines are very very different. Um, and that has a lot to do with what the spring looks like what the summer looks like in terms of moisture, so how much rainfall do we have? Uh, it has something to do with how, how hot it is. So these worms really don't tolerate really, really hot temperatures, like, like uh, anything above 100 degrees will stress them out. Anything above 105 will probably kill them. Um, but moisture is of a moderating, moderating factor on this. So if the moisture is right, they might actually survive something like 102, but not much, not much more. The other thing that's where, where they're limited is the temperature. So the temperature at the other end of the scale, so anything below five degrees Celsius or uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit will stress them out. And if you go around zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, um, they will probably die. And for that reason, we don't really see many of these worms before the beginning of April. So here's usually around the beginning of April, we see the first ones. Here's one that's in the middle of May, but that's because we didn't go out early enough to see them earlier. So I really believe that um, April, anywhere between April 10th and April 20th, you will see the first hatchlings. So if, have you, if you have seen any uh, snake worms now, you're probably not seeing snake worms. So that, that just, I just want to say that, and I'll say more about this later. But anyway, so the numbers can be staggering. So you can have up to 30 per square meter or 330 per square, sorry, 330 per square meter or 30 per square foot. That's the highest we've seen them on average. And uh, actually that this peak here uh, was associated with some, some plots that we did uh, where we saw over 600 per square meter. So th these are averages. So let's go through this, this curve. So uh, first life event is the survival of hatchlings. And I'm saying the survival of hatchlings is because they can hatch in the winter time, but they die because, you know, yeah, nice, nice and warm, generally thaw, they can hatch. But what they don't know at that point is that two days later, that general thaw is, January thaw is over and there's gonna be deep frost, which will kill them. Uh, so the first ones that survive are sometime in April, and uh, that's basically these, you know, these points over here. And then the next thing we look for is, is this peak. You know, it comes at different times. So this one is in the middle of May. This one is the beginning of beginning of June. This is one at the end of the June at end of June. And it just really depends how how moist things are. Um, the black line here is 2011, and you might remember. Well, I remember it well because I had to keep track of the weather, um, but that was the year when uh, Lake Champlain and the region had uh, a continuous flood watch for two months, beginning in April all the way, actually for probably three months in, in, into, the, into June. So it was a very, very wet, wet uh, spring. And that was really good for these worms. Uh, and you, you get, we got, a, we got a good peak that year. And then that year was also the year when we had, um, oh, what was it, uh, uh, Tropical Storm Irene. So that was sometime in August, right around here. And, and so that's, that's important. It's important to know what, what your weather is like, and, and you can almost predict a good year. So this is probably gonna, not going to be a good year because, yeah, it's nice and warm. They like warm. They don't like too hot. But uh, they also like moisture, and we have a really a dry uh, spring at the moment. Anyway, the next thing we look for after this peak is um, what are they doing as 
what is the abundance doing as as they go towards the first emergence of of the of the adults and you notice pretty much all of these these curves have this steep decline and that's probably due to two factors one is that the weather is becoming drier and the other one is that uh, these juveniles are pretty hungry so they are they're feeding on the leaf litter and they probably by the time the first adults emerge the leaf litter is probably pretty pretty much depleted in the in the woodlands and so there's not enough food to sustain like 330 uh, individuals per square meter when they're adults so then then they become adults um, and that that period when you see the first adult can range from from the beginning of July to to the end of August so it all depends on the weather you also might notice that uh, for this really heavy year when you when you found when we find a lot of these worms there's an increase in in um, abundance and that increase in abundance has something to do with that there might be some cocoons that are still viable from the previous year but they hadn't hatched in the springtime and so these these uh, cocoons stay viable for a long period of time even at least for two years you can get you can get uh, hatching from these from this from these cocoons uh, this is what this is what cocoons look like this is what 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 the, the larvae look like inside. So this is actually just albumin, um, and there's somewhere in there is, is an egg. Uh, then a couple of weeks later, you you see the first uh, the first worm type thing, a larval stage, and that continues until you have hatchlings. Stage five and stage four we label as ready to hatch, and then shortly after they reach this, they can hatch if the temperatures are correct, if the temperatures are right for hatching. So this is another way of looking at them close close up. Uh, these are about um, a tenth of an inch across. Um, on the left hand side, you see cocoons that have that dehydrated, which is one way that they survive the cold winters and droughts They dehydrate and then little damage is done to the embryos inside. And when they rehydrate, the embryos start to start to develop again. So we're getting a lot of claims now, of course, claiming that that, there's, that they find jumping worms and that they're heavily infested at this time of year. So I don't know whether whether as uh, master gardeners you are involved with the master gardener hotline, but if you are, uh, you can probably assure the people that that they don't have jumping worms, at least not visible at this time of year. They they probably have other kinds of worms, and just to show you what that would look like is. Um, two weeks ago, <clears throat> to look at look at the image on the right hand side, there's a yellow arrow, and it's pointing to a hatchling. This is what they look looked like two weeks ago. So anybody who called two weeks ago and said we have one jumping worms, they didn't see jumping worms at all. So this little thing here, that's that's a, a hatchling. And then the way to be able to tell them apart from other worms is by the way they move, right? So if you think you have jumping worms uh, and you think you uh, and you think you have identified a, a hatchling, they have to they have to be able to do this. And so agitate them a bit, and then they flip around like that. There's some other worms that do the same thing, but the, the movement is not quite as fast. And not not quite as violent. Um, so if, if they do that, likely you have you have snake worms. Here's some of the other things that other pictures have been sent in. Uh, you know, there's this uh, race clitellum. This this is a worm with a race clitellum. So here's here's your jumping worm. It has a clitellum that's pretty flat. That's pretty uh, um, flush with with the rest of the worm. Race clitellum means that you probably don't have a jumping worm. And a lot of the times. The worms have different colors along their length, other than the clitellum. Um, if you have different colors along the length of the worm, then likely you don't have have these jumping worms. Here's one uh, one uh, picture that was sent in. I have jumping worms. This is actually a red wiggler, and so they do wiggle as well. They're not quite the movement is not quite as violent uh, as as for the jumping worms. Uh, but anyway. The way you can tell a red wiggler from from a jumping worm is by looking at these these stripes. 
This worm is also known as um, California worm. It's and with the stripes, it also acquired the the name tiger worm. So if you see when when they stretch, you will see these these stripes. So that is a uh, a sign that you have a red wiggler. The other thing that's really important about red wigglers, their other name is yellow tail. So you'll see this this here at the end. You see a uh, a yellow segment. And here's another one, an even better view of it. Uh, so several segments are, are actually uh, yellow. So I encourage you to um, to be to, to investigate or to, to examine your worms really carefully as to uh, whether they're jumping worms or not. So the, this race clitellum or seeing a clitellum at this time of year before, ju before July probably means you don't have the, or you, that the worm that you're looking at is not a jumping worm. You still may have jump, jumping worms, but you don't, you haven't seen them yet. Um, so the damage in the forest starts with uh, soil modification. And I have to point out that this is not just modification done by jumping worms. The European worms have done a great deal of damage in the forests as well. Um, so, this is on the left hand side here, this image shows you what an undisturbed O horizon, so top, top horizon, organic horizon in, in the soil looks like. It's very fluffy, it's lot, got lots of organic matter in it, it's got a lot of roots and fungi growing in it. That would be a you know, typical, a great, great um, uh, organic horizon uh, untouched by earthworms. Uh, and usually, this is usually the seed bank for for the forest and it's a germination medium for many of the forest plants. So uh, ephemerals in particular will use this layer as putting for putting their roots out. Um, it's this is a yeah this is loose material but it's not so loose that it can be moved away. Then the European earthworms will take some of this material and 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 incorporate it with the with the um, with the soil below, so the mineral soil, and they make this thicker layer uh, that is also dark in color. So it's enriched in organic matter, but it is not an organic layer anymore. This is an A horizon. It usually has something like 10% organic matter versus 40, 50% organic matter in, in this O horizon. And then finally, uh, for jumping worms, you have these loose castings, and they can be uh, two inches or more th um, thick, uh, and this is a really good diagnostic for knowing whether or not you have a jumping worm invasion in a forest. If you see that, that a thick layer of these castings, you likely have jumping worms. And in both cases, whether it's the European earthworms or the uh, jumping worms, you have a modification of the forest soil that is taking away the seed bank and the germination medium. And therefore, you get less plants growing in the understory of that forest. And that's what it looks like, you know. So here's camel's hump, north, no earthworms. Here's, here's uh, one of the uh, forests that we are uh, looking at in South, South Burlington where there is jumping worms. And it's a striking difference between these two places, much less vegetation in the understory and where, where there's jumping worms. And uh, it's really not, not just the story of the jumping worm, but it's also a story of Bambi and the deer, right? So the deer, basically when the jumping worms have diminished the, diminished the, uh, the flora of the understory, so there's not really much left, left over, deer comes through and they start feeding on, on saplings. And that's not really a cool thing uh, because uh, it takes, it takes, basically takes away uh, some of the regeneration of, of the canopy species, which is, you know, sugar maple, for example. So think about what's going to happen in a hundred years time uh, when the sugar maple is blown over and uh, what is going to grow into those gaps. Um, probably not sugar maple if there's, if there's these jumping worms. I will skip questions because I'm, I'm going a little slow here and we start later. So um, I, I will honor questions at the end. So uh, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, damage is also observed in horticulture. One of the really early ones was from a place that grows uh, 
hostas. And so they have these, these thousands of varieties of hostas and they they found that at one year, this is from the New York Times, uh, 2007, one year they they, fig they figured out, well, they, they found out that that a lot of the hostas had shrunk in size, so the, the regrowth was smaller than the previous year, and that the um, uh, and that some of them were were dying, and they were able to bring it back to gazillions of worms. And then Cindy Hale, who was one of the the people that worked on on earthworms in uh, in Minnesota in in the early two thousands, identified these as uh, as jumping worms. Uh, main Department of Agriculture uh, and Cornell Corporate Extension have put, put these things out in their, um, in their fact sheets. So in nurseries and greenhouses, aminthus worms, jumping worms, reduce the functionality of soils and planting media and cause severe drought symptoms. After irrigation of, or rains, you may find these worms under the pots. These worms may be inadvertently moved to new areas with nursery stock or in soil, mulch, or compost. And then um, Cornell says, jumping worms can severely damage roots of plants in nurseries, gardens, forests, and turf. And so there's a lot of debate on whether jumping worms are actually eating or damaging roots. It's more that they're damaging the, uh, the media that the roots are growing in, and thereby that indirectly that will uh, affect the roots. Now here's an experiment that Mariam, so my soon to be doctor, Dr. Mariam, um, touch wood, um, has done. So that you see you see three groups of pots there uh, that in all of them there's um, cilantro we're growing. And uh, we we bought plugs um, and we put the plugs into three different differently treated uh, media. So the first medium is that they're all pro-grow, by the way, pro-grow professional uh, medium with mycorrhizae in them. Um, but the first the first part, the, the first group of, of pots were, there was no aminthus, no jumping worms in these pots at all. And put the plugs in and, uh, and then waited for two weeks. And this is what that looked like after two weeks. Then we also had, at the same time, we had some where aminthus had been in the pots for two weeks. And so you had some a good casting layer. These were adults, aminthus, by the way. Um, lots of castings. And we saw stunted growth. And in time, all these, these plants, within a reasonable amount of time, died. Um, and you notice that here, after two weeks, there's already a dead plant there. And they showed severe drought symptoms just as it was said in, in the um, uh, in the in the main fact sheet, and then we put uh, cilantro plugs into uh, into the soil at the same time as we put the aminthus in, and that gave us results that were um, that were mixed. So you had some plants that that died and you know, shriveled up and died, and some plant that plants that did pretty well. They weren't quite as big as as the, as the plants we put into the undisturbed medium, but uh, but they were still growing. There were still some some effects like uh, yellowing of the plants plant leaves, but the the effect was very very varied in this case. And so, I mean, this does have an effect on at least on when you when you are putting plugs into pots. And possibly, if you if you put plugs into soils with aminthus uh, in your garden, it might have you might want to grow the the plugs out a little bit before you put them in. Okay, how do they move around? Horticulture, compost, mulch, uh, plant exchanges, and recreation. The way I became interested in these worms was after I bought a house, uh, and the house was done up, of course, you know, before before the owners sold it, and they had uh, the flower beds out. You know, up front, the front yard had a really thick, a really thick mulch layer on there, and it was gone within a growing season. And I asked myself, why is that? Why is why are why is six inches of mulch disappearing in a, in a growing season? And I found these worms, and I said, oh, I've got to figure these these worms out. All right. So here's here's an example again from my from my home 
from from my neighborhood so I, I live up here somewhere uh, but you know around here in this in this block people people tend to rake their leaves and they put them into bags and then the bags are being taken to a, a transfer station where all this leaf mulch is is hanging out and so people go there and they they pick up their pick up their leaf mulch for free in some places um, and it just so happens that all of these neighborhoods have these snake worms in them. Sorry, they'll say snake worms, jumping worms in them. And uh, and so unsuspecting people come to this, this transfer station that pick up the mulch, the leaf mulch. It's great to build organic matter. Um, and anyway, so they pick that up, they put it in their garden. And so they also put these, these snake worms into the gardens. And you can get, so that's, that's leaf mulch, don't do it. Uh, and then there's also um, uh, responses as of about four years ago uh, that uh, people find these worms in uh, in bags of compost from from major suppliers of compost. And I, I can't say who they are, but there are some composts that that have been in, in, uh, infested. And <clears throat> the composters are interested to work with us, and so we'll we'll be working with them this summer. To see a whether they actually have these these worms in their uh, in their operations and where they are and what they can do. So can they be controlled? Uh, and do we uh, what do we tell panic callers? So you know what do I tell panic callers? Um, first of all, if you haven't gotten them yet, avoid getting them. Right. So we say, oh, you know, we have we have these these uh, snake worms that they don't they turn out to be not jumping worms. Uh, then I say maybe you don't have them. Keep keep an eye out. Um, but by all means, if if you find out, you know, if by by the mid by midsummer, by August, uh, end of August, you don't have any adults to look at that have that you can identify as snake worms, then please don't panic. Uh, but do the following things. If you really have, um, if you really uh, have a need for plant materials, grow them from seed or cuttings, exchange bare root plants. Some nurseries um, offer bare root uh, plants, so you, you can get the bare root plants. And then also um, solarize soils and soil material that you buy in. Uh, does that kill um, other organisms? Absolutely. But you can you can easily re-inoculate that, uh, that soil or that compost um, with soil that, that you haven't yet solarized that might be in your garden. Remember, you don't have, this is about people you don't, that don't have these, these worms yet. So you can re-inoculate that and that, that goes pretty quickly. Uh, use bare root shrubs, grow from seed, propagate plants yourself. If you're a master gardener, you probably learned all about uh, planting. Planting sticks in the ground, um, or putting uh, uh, where to take cuttings on, on a plant, and then how to root them uh, to get bare root stuff. So I'm not going to say much about that because you probably all know about that. Solarization, the thing that that has worked for us, and I'm going to do a little bit more studies of this on in the summer. Uh, we basically I make up a solarization package of material, so 10 to 15 feet. Uh, long and maybe six to six feet wide. Um, I use uh, a plastic drop cloth that you can, that's that's the cheapest stuff you can probably buy. Uh, and basically I put part of the drop cloth down on the ground and I do this so that the worms don't escape into the ground. I put compost on top of that or any, anything that you want to solarize. Um, then I put another sheet over the top and I tuck that sheet under the compost mulch and so, or soil uh, so that worms have to go kind of funny way to get out. Uh, and then I, I just take the sides of the, um, the bottom sheet and pull them up over the top of, of the other one. So they really have to, the worms really have to go a long way. So nice sunny day in, as of mid-May, as of you know next week, might be hot enough. So it has to be sunny, has to be warm. Uh, but as of mid-May, I would I would suspect that we have some really good sunny days, and um, 
And if you have, leave it out for two days, then temperature reaches something like 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to kill both cocoons and, and the earthworms themselves. If you buy compost in plastic bags, put the plastic bags in the sun, single layer, don't stack them. If you got them already, then, I mean, one of the really important things, imp most important advice I can give people is this. Don't panic. Do not, do not scream. Do not yell. Do not jump up and down and, and do funny things. So first of all, don't let them worm shame you. If anybody says, oh, you've got jumping worms, you're bad. Don't let them do that. Um, every, anybody, this can happen to anybody. Uh, this is like catching COVID. Um, maybe not quite as bad. <laughs> uh, put it in perspective. What are some of the things you can do though? Right, so you have the worms, what can you do? So if you have uh, vegetable beds and you have worms in that, uh, you can, one way that you can discourage these worms in vegetable beds is probably uh, till, till the beds. So if you have, for example, you have a really thick layer of, of castings, till them under. Uh, it will not kill everything, not, it will not kill all the, the worms that are in there, but it will reduce the numbers. You will still find jumping worms, but it will reduce the numbers. Each one of those worms can uh, produce 60 cocoons. So each one of these worms that you remove will be 60 cocoons fewer for the next year. And so that's important. These worms live in the top two inches of the soil. Uh, and yeah, when I have, my potatoes can have them at six or seven inches down. They live where there is, where there is stuff to eat. Um, but anyway, uh, top six inches are probably the most imp important part of the, the soil to disrupt. So it depends on when you, when, so the, the effectiveness depends when you till. So don't, don't till anything until mid-May because then you probably have mostly cocoons. You want to tell around about this, the same time that you have these these peaks. Maybe a couple, maybe a week later than this, these peaks, so that these worms are not so small. And you're not disrupting them. Um, so somewhere between mid May and mid -Ju June, you should you you know bef obviously before you plant. So it's probably before um, Memorial Day. You should do this. You can all, if you till after mid October. That's when. That's probably not useful either, because then most most of the individuals will be there as cocoons. Uh, so doing seedbed preparation, but don't prepare your seedbed in April. So biocontrol. So we have been working with uh, Bovaria bassiana, which is uh, an entomopathogenic fungus. So it's it's certified for use on entomopathogen, so insects, insect, insect pests. Um, it's already certified as a biopesticide against, um, against insects, which makes it easier to have it certified for earthworms. That's why we're trying to stick to commercial products. Um, here's an example where Mariam is uh, working on an experiment with uh, geranium and, and earthworms and this Bovaria bassiana. So we have lots and lots of pots to look at, lots and lots of soils to take apart. Uh, it's a, it's labor, highly labor intensive. And here's, here's what she does. She actually takes the Bovaria bassiana and so from Botanic Guard and she grows it on agar and then she takes the agar extract and grows it on millet. So this is mycotized millet. And one thing that we are planning to do in the summer is to, to find out a way that we can that we can provide a, well we want to find a protocol that works in your own home like using pressure cookers rather than um, commercial uh, uh, sterilization techniques um, how can we you know how can we make this this technology available to homeowners and people in, at nurseries so that that they can make their own mycotized millet uh, the reason why we want that want to do this is because if you if you mycotize millet rather than applying Bovaria bassiana by itself, then you increase the chance that these earthworms die. So here's this graph. 
mortality on the y-axis from zero to half 80 percent there so it means 80 percent of the worms die and then we have the different treatments here so we have millet 15 grams there's this little line here that is millet without the fungus added it's 15 grams per pot and we find no mortality at all mycotized we add mycotized millet we get something like 80 percent we use 25 grams of millet uh, we get a little bit more mortality when we just add millet and that might have just that might just have something to do with with other factors we don't really understand why you have the 25 percent or sorry the 15 percent uh mortality when you just add uh, millet without without the fungus but we get again we get about 80 percent of that if we use straight bovaria bassiana so not Botanica, so not Boveria bassiana out of the bag, but Boveria bassiana that we grew from the botanic guard, isolated from the botanic guard, then we again get some like 75% of, of mortality. So it's still a really good, uh, good mortality ratio. Um, and if we don't put anything into that, into that, um, if we add just water, then we, so there's nothing here, nada. Uh, we get some like 20% mortality. And the reason why we think we get 20% mortality here is because um, the worms are not getting millet that they can feed on. Uh, and therefore, you know, there's some, some that will run out of food and, and there's greater, uh, greater mortality that way. So Bovaria bassiana works really well uh, when it is pure Bovaria bassiana or when it's grown on, on the millet more interventions but unlikely solutions so uh, we've isolated some or mariam isolated some uh, some microbial agents from dead, dead cocoons and worms and we got we got something like a hundred percent mortality with some of those agents after after a, a week of exposure um, other things so people are saying oh how about how about flatworms hammerhead worms they're they're known to feed on uh, on earthworms, uh, they're not really good at catching and and devouring um, uh, jumping worms. They're good at uh, doing this to European earthworms. Uh, the other thing about these flatworms, they're not from here either, so they they are an invasive species that is slowly coming into Vermont. Uh, and you probably get, get if you were on a on a hotline, you're probably going to get some calls about these strange worms that have that look like a hammer, hammerhead shark. Um, uh, they also have a, a high, a, a, high a, a neurotoxin that's really toxic. It's the same toxin that the puffer fish has. Uh, ants, maybe. Uh, so ants are also uh, defend their ter territory against these these against worms, earthworms, uh, and I don't know whether they are uh, fast enough to capture these fast moving uh, jumping worms. So my biocontrol summary is that there are biopesticides that are uh, that are able to kill the worms, but they're not currently certified. There, I should say, there is some hope on uh, on the horizon, and that the agency of agriculture may actually here in Vermont may actually not in other states yet, but in Vermont might actually allow the use of Bovaria bassiana or a related fungus called Metarhizium. Um, an ISO play um, as as a as a earthworm control, um, but we're we're waiting for final word on that. And uh, so we hope that you can mycotize your own millet at some point with kitchen equipment. And we'll we'll put that on a web page or we'll send this onto the library once the protocol is established. And we we'd love to hear back from you whether it worked for you. So if if uh, your Millet looks like that. Then everything has happened. If you any any color, green or or purple or red, then you have contamination. And it's probably not going to work for you. So we would like to know uh, that you know how we would like to get some some feedback once we have this out. Uh, chemical control soap, uh, which the active ingredient is is a saponin, and you probably or have already heard through the grapevine. At some point, that there, there was a fertilizer that had saponins in it um, that that was used on on golf courses to control earthworms. Um, saponins are not 
they're not they're not certified as uh, vermicides either. Uh, so, but but we we did we did some experiment with soap anyway, and um, here's a here's the graph, the mortality graph, uh, mortality on the y-axis, and then treatment on the on the x-axis, um, and you have three areas. So this this white area is um, millet, so mycotized millet uh, with Bovaria bassiana or metarhizium and isoplay, or now known as brunium. And then uh, just with millet, uh, and then here, this one is uh, just the plant and the worm. So we have plants in here too, nasturtium, it was, and um, the mortality, so this is a fraction, so this 0.5 is 50%, 0.9 is 90%. And then uh, we had uh, different treatments of soap, so uh, some kind of Maya soap, I think it was, and so five milliliters per, per liter of soap added. Um, into into uh, bucket bucket and that was applied to the plants and we also used vinegar vinegar does really really well because like now almost ninety percent mortality of adult worms which are not as susceptible as the as the little critters um, the juveniles um, but it also killed the plants so you know if you don't want to kill your plants don't use vinegar um, for soap it slows the plant growth. It doesn't necessarily kill kill them, but it slows the plant growth. So if you have something growing already, likely that soap is going to kill kill that. So I should say that the lowest soap treatment in terms of what the plants look like actually gives you a very similar uh, mortality rating for for the earthworms than the, the Bovaria bassiana, um, and this was not actually too bad. A retardation in growth. This was maybe a week behind. These were like three or four weeks behind. So we're probably going to try out a little less soap, like 2.5 milliliters of soap per, per liter of, of uh, water, and see whether we can slow, we, we can improve that, that growth of the plants uh, while still killing the worms. So the chemical control summary here is uh, there are no chemicals that are currently certified as vermicides. There, is, there are a couple of saponins that are certified as pesticides. One is a fungicide that's derived from uh, quinoa. And the other one is a saponin that's derived from the soap bark uh, tree. Sorry, that, um, that is harvested in tropical forests. So it's not very, it's not very uh, sustainable. Uh, but the quinoa might work, and we're going to work. We're going to work with that this summer to find out. So, if you have a pesticide certified pesticide, then sometimes you can request that that is going to be used. That that you can use it for another pest that it's not certified for, as long as there is no environmental um, issues with it. That means. <clears throat> that, that doesn't mean that you can run out there and buy that pesticide and, and apply it. It just means that you have that somebody has a chance to petition the uh, agency of AG for for that. Uh, and so the, the big thing is, you know, you have to show that there is no environmental issues. Um, and so we are working on some of some of that. Uh, see whether we can provide some. Uh, some magic potion to kill the worms and not and not the uh, the plants. That's of course the other thing. You know you don't want to kill the plants. So maybe something that you use for um, as a fungicide on seed may actually kill kill a plant when you add it. So don't rush out there and, and try and get these these little potions until they're tested. So the Bovaria bassiana works pretty well if it's mycotized. Anyway, uh, here's this. Uh, uh, if you buy horticultural soaps, uh, they don't work on, on worms. So most of the horticultural soaps don't have saponins in them, which are the active ingredients that kill the worms. So there's this one other thing that people have, have been using illegally. Uh, it's this tea tree seed extract. It works really well uh, on worms, but it also works really well on fish. 
So therefore, it's there's an environmental impact if you're applying it close to uh, a stream or a wetland, uh, and you know people order it from from this this place here. Uh, but as I said, it's not certified for any pests in the United States, uh, and the, and the certifications that that people have in China don't count here. So the application is not legal. Check with your extension service. So our summer plants, test Bovea bassiana at different growth stages of the worm, produce a protocol for mycotizing the millet, uh, test several surfactants and saponins, test the biochar product, and then test compost and mulch solarization uh, so that we have, uh, we can figure out, you know, how thick can you make that mulch layer in, uh, so we have tested this on compost before, but mulch is a totally different thing. So we hope to still be able to achieve these really high temperatures. So you wonder, so I've been doing this for 10 years, almost 12 years now, and you wonder why this is so slow, right? So this, why is this so slow? Well, there's a lack of, lack of funding from large funding agencies. They don't want to know, right? So USDA says, well, this, we have other problems, you know, we have, diseases of corn, we want to do uh, genetic engineering on on soybeans, all those things are much higher priority than uh, than crazy snake worms books, I think in part because the USDA doesn't the funding agency in within the USDA doesn't really understand what how big this big of a problem this really is. But then again, maple syrup is not a commodity like corn, tobacco and and um, and soybeans. So the 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 um, priorities are not there. Uh, the other reason is you know, these these worms have only one life cycle per year. That means that uh, you know whatever we do, we we can only do it once a year. And so every time we try something one year, and it doesn't work out really well, uh, we have to do the following year. Now, if we if we were to were we if we were able to expand our ability to um, to do research, then we could probably do more experimentations in parallel and then get more data that way. But that again costs more money. And you know, if you're thinking about how much it actually costs to, to just rent uh, a green, greenhouse space, it's something like a thousand dollars for for three months at, at a lower rate that, that we get we can get at the university. So we really do need to do more research on worms and cocoons um, and replicate that research in multiple years. So that's one thing. We're actually quite lucky to have a few people that uh, that have given us money and uh, they're here. So there's three concerned citizens who don't really want their names uh, published. They just want, they actually don't want me to talk about them at all, but they have given significant amounts of money uh, to us. And they're, they're kind of saying, well, you know, you guys, you should really start uh, thinking about if we give you money to see whether you can put a challenge out there as like NPR. Well, you know, if you give us money, we will match it. <laughs> it's a lot of work to even contemplate that. Um, uh, the Hardy Plant Club has has right from the beginning that uh, like five, six years ago, they, they have given us money to to start some of this research. The Epley Foundation for Research which is a small foundation in Rhode Island has, has given us money. The Vermont Agency of Agriculture has given us a specialty crop block grant, which, which helps, but it's, it's still a small grant. And the New England Greenhouse Conference has also given us a small grant. Uh, so there's people out there that want to fund this kind of research. And uh, you know, the more the merrier, you know, we, are, we are writing grants all the time. Uh, but that's really why things are slow. And so with that, I, I'll open this up to questions. I have, uh, I, have, I have a question. Am I on go there? ahead. Oh, there's my video. Sorry. Hey, hey there. Um, yeah, my name is Emily Weinberg. I uh, am in charge of this local plant sale that's been going on for literally 30 years. It's handed down to me. Um, but I'm thinking this will be the last year, and I'm being really careful and sourcing all my plants from gardens that promise up and down they do not have they've never seen a jumping worm mm -hmm. um would you suggest i cancel this plant sale in the future just to i, I really hear that 
preventing the invasion is is like critical. I live in, next to a maple syrup farm. I do not want to get these creatures. Um, I do have one person who has a garden. She's like, oh, it's just an invasive species. It's fine. We're all invasive species. She kind of got a little uppity about it. And um, I think I need to go back to her and say, sorry, you can't be involved. Well, I think that, I think one of the, the, the important things is that we put across and, you know, as master gardeners, and I assume you're a master gardener. With, Not uh, really, but. But you have the, they have the plant sale there, right? So. Yeah. I know. Like, as as concerned citizens, we have yeah. we have an obligation, I guess, to um, inform the members of the public about about these kinds of problems. And so, what I would say to this person is, well, think about it this way. Yes, we are all invasive species, and we as we are not we are not going to drink poison because humans are invasive species. So don't say that to her. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that to her, but say to her, well, think about the impact that this that this has on businesses, right? So it, it's not just another invasive species in in a wetland, right? So there's it's not just garlic mustard, which, by the way, also has economic, economic and ecological uh, um, uh, impacts. But this is a this is a species that that will damage a, a forest that is the livelihood of others. Yeah. Right. So it's maybe not this generation of, of uh, maple sugars, but the following generation. You know, if, if, if this business in, is in family hands, then uh, you know, mom and dad will say, hey, uh, Jim boy or Margaret girl, uh, why don't you um, carry this on? This makes good money, you know, we get 60,000 gallons of, of uh, syrup out of our out of operation. That's like $300,000, 400,000 more. I don't know, close to a million dollars. Um, why don't you continue this? And so if in 30 years time, you know, there, there is no regeneration, or the, you know, regeneration in, in that forest, regeneration of maples in the forest, then uh, it's, it's not a sustainable business. And then what are you going to do with that? You build houses on it, right? You say, well, you know, with Act 150 being being sort of weakened now, uh, we can use use some of this land to build houses on, and that makes makes you money as well. So I mean, that's, and then of course there there are other businesses that are that are uh, that are important. Uh, tourism, for example, if you lose all the maple forests, then you're losing some of the color of the foliage, and then you you get less less of a um, of tourism here in Vermont, and that that is an impact on the on the economy as well. One, so one I second. think that there's some arguments yeah. that you you can level at people. Then yeah. coming back to your question, should you cancel it? Yeah, I would I would do the following. I would say actually there's there's two things you can do. One is to say I cannot 100% guarantee that this is one free. Uh, these are the impacts. If you already have the worms, it's probably not going to be a big, big deal. If you live in the city, it may not be a big deal. If you live on on the edge of a forest, big deal. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you can provide maybe a few buckets of water where they can wash the roots. That's what I was wondering. Hmm. You can wash the roots, and then uh, then they can replant replant that. So you have to wash. So the way I wash roots is, um, now see, see you currently. Um, um, the way I wash roots is I have two buckets. One bucket was where I I I, I wash off the the majority of that of that soil. So that's my dirty bucket. And then I go into the the clean bucket and I wash the rest of it and I kind of mis gently massage so the rest of the soil out of there. And then I inspect. Can I inspect the um <laughs> I am upside Lynette, you're upside down. Um <laughs> no, I'm upside down and I don't know how to fix it. Well don't fix it, but don't I, worry. It's a good yoga thing. I do, thing. I do anyway, so let, let me just finish. Let me just finish. I have a question as well. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I saw you all. So um just and this may be an, an the answer to this is is I think for everybody who has plant sales. Um so clean. Look, look for cocoons. The, the worms will, will come out in the wash. 
Um, so offer that bare root option, but you know, okay. tell them that they have to do it themselves. Yep. At one, on the premises. And then the question is what you do with that soil that might be- I know, that's- right? so, uh, okay. I, would, I would probably put soap in that water and that will kill the worms. Okay. Uh, okay, are we ready for some more questions? I have several yes. here that came in on the chat. And, well, there's, uh, there's actually a couple of people that, that have raised their hands. So why don't we go with those first? I and don't then know how, okay. How do you raise your hand? Uh, uh, there's. I'd five. like a, I'd like to ask a few questions. Let's let's get started with Marianne then. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for doing the research. I'm waiting for your answers. Um, I I have a couple things that I'm planning to do and I don't know if it'll help. I have a huge infestation and we do have a forest right near us. So I, I'm very concerned, but I've also not anxious anymore. I'm letting go and letting nature, you know, whatever happens, happens. So I'm not, I'm not nervous, but I do want to do what I can do. Um, the first thing is people told me uh, I wonder if it's the shallow rooted plants that are more in danger or more vulnerable than the yes. deeper rooted plants. Yes. And is there a list of plants that would help us who aren't master gardeners to know which plants are more vulnerable than others? That's one question. The second I can question, answer that right away. So I, I, I'm getting yes, to that age yes. where I forget things. <laughs> yes. So um, I, I'd, I'd say uh, I, I, if you if you buy stuff, ask ask the the horticultural specialist where you buy things. Um, there is no list as yet. People are working on lists, uh, but it's they're not not quite there yet. Then the other thing that you mentioned, you you have a forest nearby. So one, you can probably establish buffers. So one of the things that has come out of Minnesota. There's a researcher there who says that if you have a prairie vegetation, so you can buy prairie mix or uh, prairie mix on, online. If you have a prairie vegetation, um, the worms don't really like to be in that. So if you put a, you know, a foot, two feet buff buffer uh, between you and the forest, then maybe uh, it's going to stop the worms from getting there. Yeah, I have a road, but anyway. Um... So my chat, my um, my plan this this uh, this time around, uh, I thought around those plants that might be vulnerable. I would try that mustard water, pouring it slowly in the soil and catching the worms and then killing them. Sure, I think that's that's a that's a great idea. Um, have a bucket of bucket of soapy water next to you where you can throw the worms. Yes, that was the plan. That's one. And, and you might have to do this a couple of times a year because, uh, you know, the hatchlings will keep coming. And when shall I start this? Uh, you should start this uh, early June. Thank you. The next thing I read about was if I put biochar finely ground in August, September, that they would, it would kill them in 16 days. There's, there's no real evidence of that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And the second, the third one was in June or July to put on 3.0.1 fertilizer diluted 20 times. No, forget it. That doesn't work either. Nope. Okay. Okay. So there, there was a, there was a fertilizer that was like a really low, uh, two zero zero or two zero or oh, two zero three fertilizer that had, that had a, a pesticide in it, but it's disallowed. You cannot use it because it's not it's not environmentally safe and it's not certified, uh, and and you can't buy it anymore. Okay, so that might be that, that's where that might come from. But fertilizer by itself doesn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna. I've always mulched my gardens because I like nice edges, but I realize that's where the worms probably took off. Um, so. When I get this time, when I get some mulch, I've used usually used my own mulch from trees uh, that we cut mm -hmm. down. But now this year is the first year I'm going to buy mulch. And before, when I get it now, because you won't give me the list of safe mulches, you said you can't do that. 
Well, I, I don't even know what, what a safe mulch is. So, I mean, I don't know. I can't give you oh, that okay. list so because I don't know. When the mulch comes, I have to do that plastic envelope business. Yeah, or or you can put it if you have a driveway, you can put it on on the driveway and then, then put then put the the top, not the top, but the, the plastic drop cloth over it. Oh, that's much easier. Put it on a my gravel driveway. Uh, gravel, no. they might they might get through the gravel. Yeah. Okay, but envelope them in plastic and let them burn. Let let, let them burn for a couple of days. Yes. Couple of days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's let's move on to the next person. Um, Thank you. Sure. Dr. Goris, have you got uh, folks that are asking you questions directly, or would you like me to move on to the questions? From well, the there was one other person who had to, had a question, but I, uh, if I could, I don't sure. know how to raise my hand or make myself turn upside down. <laughs> but I do have a question. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I have lost sleep over this whole scene. Um, last year, I planted four rows of beans in my vegetable garden. One came up and then died. And when I went to see what had happened to all the bean seeds, there was nothing in there. And there's evidence of jumping worms. Is that po possibly what got them? I don't think that jumping worms eat the bean seeds at all. Uh, okay. So it's, it's probably not that. There might be some other other critter in there that that uh, that is to blame. Um, okay. My so other... it, it, the plant damage that you see is not always. You can't always blame it on on the, no. the jumping worms, but there there are other things that can go wrong as well. Since then, I have been collecting eggshells, and I have been just barely crushing them, putting them in the toaster oven, and making them really sharp. Is that something that might do anything to like slice them up? I don't know. Uh, they're good at avoiding such things, I think. Ah. So I, I put them out there anyway. It's good for your soil. Uh, yeah. Increases the pH, adds calcium. Yep. Uh, good stuff. Yep. Well, I, if I had, get any results, I will let somebody know. Yeah. So let's move on to um, some of the questions in the in the chat. Okay, here we go. Uh, Dr. Gores, if the jumping worms are eating organic matter, why do their castings not have any benefits to the soil? People use European earthworm castings to amend their soil. So why are jumping worm castings so devoid of nutrients? Uh, they're not devoid of nutrients, um, but I think the damage is, is done because the roots don't, don't tap into those nutrients very well because the the roots need need places to put themselves down into and and these castings are so loose that uh so that that the nutrients cannot be taken up so let me tell you one more thing about nutrients right so and, and you probably already know this a little bit because you probably know about blossom end rot nutrients need to be need to be dissolved in water right so they have to be in a certain form ionic form and they have to be dissolved in in that soil water that the roots are sitting in right so the problem with the castings is that that water um, percolates through that really quickly so there is very little soil water in there after a few days after a rain they dry out relatively quickly um, and that just means the plants are not able to tap into those uh, stores of of nutrients. That's, that's my that's my guess. Um, the other guess is that you know the, the, the roots are just not very good at at getting in. Well, they, they get into yeah they get into the into the castings okay, but they don't not get in a real good foothold there. So I okay. think it's 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 a it's a it's an it's an effect of not just they're not being not just associated with nutrients being there, but nutrients being available uh, to the plant because there's just not enough moisture. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions about solarizing. Mm -hmm. One is uh, a person is ordering four yards of compost mixed with topsoil. How long should this person solarize the pile? Well, if it's if it's six inches thick, that, so 
you can't just solarize the pile, right? So if you have a, a heap that's, a, that's two or three feet deep, <clears throat> then you can't just drape something over it and hope that it solarizes everything because the bottom of that, at the bottom of those two feet, uh, the temperature will still be you know, ambient. But if it's six, six inches thick, then uh, it'll kill, it'll kill the, the worms. So, and solarization, two days of good sun. Um, so the so the trick is the trick is to spread that that uh, compost and mulch out and make great. it don't don't have a don't have a heap as it comes off the truck. Okay, great. Uh, the second question is: Can I solarize my raised beds by covering with plastic, or should I dig out the soil and follow your solarizing methods? You could. Um, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, and uh, if if my back is anything to go by, uh, my I have back ache from last weekend, a beautiful weekend. I was digging soil, I was turning the soil in my garden, and yeah, I'm still aching. <laughs> so digging out the soil is, is a lot of work. Uh, you might want to you might want to try and the solarization will probably in the soil itself will probably reach down to about one inch, two inches. Uh, the reason why I think that it's okay at this time of year is because most of the, the, uh, the cocoons will reside in the top two inches of the, of the soil. And so while they're, so cocoons don't move around, they can't escape. If you have worms, then they will be able to escape. Uh, so the hatchlings also don't really move very far. So I would, you wouldn't you won't be able to get every single one of the the worms uh but you'll probably get quite a few of them at this time of year by just draping something over your soil okay great and uh one last one on solarization can i use the double plastic treatment on shredded leaves from last year that's a really good question and this is this is one of the questions i i was hoping to answer this summer uh so i'm going to go back to that okay Right. Like here's some some of the things I, I want to use. Uh, so solarize, uh, test compost and mulch solarization. So the mulch is a, is a different um, material, obviously, than compost. Uh, it may have different thermal properties that don't allow heat to be transmitted as as easily. So I'm going to try that out. It's it's worth you doing it anyway. I think you you'll find it you find that that works, but uh, I don't really want to promise you it works until I have done the experiment. Okay, great. Uh, next question. You spoke of soil modification in forests caused by both jumping worms and European earthworms. Can you speak about whether the same takes place in gardens with the European worms? As you know, the number of earthworms has often been used as one indicator of soil health. So are you saying that even in gardens with beds that have annual crops each year, European earthworms are more damaging than helpful? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that in, in forests, there's damage done by European earthworms. So in, in gardens, uh, you know, most of those worms are, are just, um, yeah, I mean, most, most of these worms are, are just tunneling through that, that soil. They, they're, uh, um, their castings are rich in, in nutrients. Um, some of those cast below ground, they don't cast at the top of the soil. In, in the case of, in the case of the, the jumping worms, the castings are thick at the surface and uh, they're loose very different to the castings of of worms that come from eurasia and so that's that's a big difference in in a garden that makes a big difference in in a forest it has pretty much the same consequence okay um what are the highest elevation these worms have been observed it has to do with the the, the growing the sorry the, the the growing the length of the growing season if the growing season is less than 70 days is my guess so 90 days for sure so they, they need at least i think they need at least 70 days to develop from um, hatchling 
to mature adults. So if your growing season is less than 70 days, so going from, from the last frost in the spring to the first frost in, in, uh, in the summer, uh, it's less than 70 days. Uh, so it's less than 70 days, then, then most likely uh, they won't be able to live there. So I know that in, in the Adirondacks, there are some places that have a growing season of 59 days. And they are in, in those areas of the Adirondacks that you don't have to worry. But there's also areas in Adirondacks that uh, where there's a, where they're now finding a lot of these worms. Okay, um, I think we have time for just a couple of more questions. Uh, you talked about mycotized millet as, a, as an option, and a viewer was asking, how does mycotized millet affect other critter, uh, other soil critters? Um, Mycotest millet will will affect mainly insects. So uh, some of the beneficial beneficials that are in 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 the soil may not be affected. So beneficials, I don't mean you know beneficials that that greenhouse workers uh, buy to uh, insects that they buy to uh, to parasitize other insects. Uh, I don't mean those. I I'm, I mean like fungi, bacteria. Um, uh, protozoan nematodes are probably not affected by it. And so the part of the idea of the mycotized millet is that it's also acting as something that prolongs the life of that fungus. So it, it provides food for the fungus. You can grow on that. And it's also designed to act like a bait for the worm. Um, and so that whatever is eating millet, uh, that's of that about that size of of a worm uh, may be affected, uh, but there's not too many things that eat millet, uh, and and I don't think that any mammals and uh, vertebrate type creatures will be affected by it at all. Okay, we're just about at the end. Here's a very quick question: um, This person's wondering if spotted salamanders eat these worms because salamanders live in the soil most of the year yeah that's a really good question <clears throat> people have found that so i'm not about yellow spotted uh, salamanders but the red backs uh, tend to be reduced in numbers for a few reasons uh, when there's these worms so these worms basically try to be in the same kind of spaces as these the red back salamanders and so there's competition with the salamanders for space. Uh, they're also pretty, you know, these worms are pretty fast moving. So they, they may not provide the best food source. And, and they tend to also um, uh, be of the wrong size for the red back salamanders. So I don't know about the yellow spotted. Uh, there's, 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 uh, there's also birds that, that feed on them. Uh, there's there's natural predators, but these these worms occur in such large numbers that you would have to have a herd of yellow spotted uh, salamanders to go through there. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Gores. Uh, that's um, all the time we have now, and so I'd just like to thank you for spending time with us today. And there we well, go. thank you for. Thank you for turning up in such large numbers. Uh, it's good to spread the word. So, uh, just a, just a final word to those of you uh, who who have plant sales or that work with the public or your master gardeners. Try and spread the news. Try and but spread it in, in such a way that people don't freak out. So, I mean, there there are people out there that do very strange things uh, that will probably not not cause any reduction in, in the number of, of jumping worms at all. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's usually, some of these things are dangerous, what they're doing are dangerous, not just for the environment, but dangerous to themselves. And uh, so try and kind of say, well, you know, they're a problem. They're a problem because they can, they can, cause, uh, they, they can cause economic damage, make the case for, for maple syrup saying, you know, uh, maple syrup people might be might be affected by this uh, horticulture for sure is affected by it right so uh, there's people that don't want to buy plants from certain nurseries anymore which is is uh, understandable if if you have this fear um, 
but so there, there are real effects that 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 they're not just oh it's it's uh, it's it's dandelion crawling around it's not that it's it's a actually very damaging creature that's out there that that causes harm to economic enterprise and that means that you know if you're a small business you can lose you can lose a lot of money and a lot of uh, um, you know you can lose your livelihood if if this continues and it's about right now it's about stopping the spread and so people need to know and it's i should also tell you one one more story and then i shut up and go away um i got a i got an email from from a nursery a nursery in in washington dc there for the first time since they opened they had these these jumping worms and they said we had just potted up um 20, plants ready for sale and um and we we found out that that what we potted them in uh, had these jumping worms in them, and so now we really don't want to sell these plants. This is a commercial nursery, and they said so. We're planning we're we're planning to repot everything with a different growing uh, growing mix. Um, and said, well, is is that a good idea? But I said, well, it's a good idea, except for that it's a lot of work. And they said, we don't care about a lot of work. We just don't want to spread these worms. So if we have to repot 20,000 20, plants, we'll do this. We'll just spend a couple of weekends and before we open and sell these plants. And they did that. So uh, it's, it's a question of um, how important you feel that this is mm -hmm. and how important you feel that these, these plant cells are. And so it it should not be it should not be much of a a burden on people to clean the roots on your premises or on the premises where you are having that plant sale, and then inspecting the roots for cocoons and worms. Marianne, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Well, <clears throat> actually, I'm afraid that we have we're out of time. We're actually over time. Just one quick question. You said vinegar kills them. Can I put vinegar on my garden uh, where there are no plants and get rid of them there and then use that soil the next year? Sure, you can try that. The vinegar thank should you. break down pretty quickly. Good. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Gores, for spending time with us today as we tackle this invasive species in our landscapes. It's good to know we have such a great resource in you. And I hope all of you today feel more confident in identifying and managing the impact of the Asian jumping worm. Thank you all for joining us and happy gardening. Yeah, get to the garden. Beautiful out there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.